you know, we launched a couple satellites out of Russian submarine. This guy starts talking to me about wanting to show that humanity be, be, could become a uh, multi-planetary species. Elon's up in front of us just tapping away on his computer. What the fuck do you think that idiot Savan is up to up there? Jeff Stearns, connected through cars. If they're bigwigs, we'll have them on the show. And yes, we'll talk about cars and everything else. Here he is now, Jeff Stearns. So you just mentioned SpaceX and Elon Musk as if my listener knows that Jim Kentrell has that background. So do you mind setting that up a little bit? As a result of the work I did in Russia in the 90s uh, for the U.S. government, one of the things was we converted ICBMs to not carry nuclear weapons, but instead carry satellites into orbit. So turning swords into plowshares, if you like. And we, you know, we launched a couple of satellites out of Russian submarines. I'm probably one of the few Americans that have been in Murmansk, uh, which is their submarine base in the northern part of Russia. And, uh, you know, we did that with some other ground-based ICBMs. So uh, about 2001, after I was well done with the Russians, um, I get this phone call out of the blue uh, from a guy. That I thought his name was Ian Musk. And um, I was, it was a Friday afternoon. I was on my way home. And I had the top down on the car. It was a beautiful July afternoon. And northern Utah in the summer is God's country. It's just, it's just fantastic. Imagine northern Michigan is about the only thing that sort of competes with it. But so anyhow, I'm on my way home. Only for three months. Exactly. But anyway. Just like just like northern uh, Utah. It's the same thing. Colder than hell the rest of the year. Uh, so, so, so you know, this guy starts talking to me about wanting to show that humanity be, be, could become a uh, multi-planetary species and all this sort of thing. And that uh, he needed to talk to me because he needed Russian rockets. And I was the guy that he was told could help him buy Russian rockets. So, you know, he mentioned this thing called PayPal, which I'd never heard of, and, you know, how he just left there and so forth. And, you know, I, I said, look, I'll, I'll uh, call you when I get home because I, I can hardly hear you. And uh, I said, fine. So I got home, you know, said hi to the kids. And uh, this was early afternoon. Went into my study and, and called him back. And, you know, it was talking about cell phones. This was uh, at a Motorola StarTac, you know. <laughs> cool phone. So, so I called him back and uh, I get a fax machine. And uh, so I'm thinking, okay, he, he told me he was a, you know, internet billionaire and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, right. So use a fax machine to make phone calls. Good. Uh, didn't, didn't believe it. You know, so about 20 minutes later, he calls me back and he's, he's angry and he wants to know why I didn't call him back. And I explained and he's like, oh, okay, well, this is my mobile phone. So he starts in on this whole thing about, you know, Sending sending mice to Mars and proving that humans could could transit the time to Mars, you know, the six to fourteen months, and uh, you know that that he wants to do this mission with his with his own private money, and you know he could he could blow his money, you know, drinking mai tais on a beach somewhere, but he'd rather blow it, you know, with with space missions. <laughs> and so I, you know, this was not you might sound this might sound unusual, but it was not an unusual. Occurrence, you know, I have these guys with a lot of money out of Silicon Valley wanting to do this. I'd probably fielded, I don't know, six or seven different calls like this over the, the prior few years. And this was, you know, at the time the internet bubble was kind of about ready to burst. And Tesla is not a Tesla thing. Tesla was a thing, but it wasn't his thing yet. He was not a founder of Tesla, by the way. That was Martin Eberhardt that founded Tesla. He, he became an investor later and then force Martin out. But that's a whole other story. So at any rate, you know, so I, I, I had had, you know, the Gross Brothers and Idea Lab, and I'd taken some of these guys to Russia and so forth, and they were always interested in this, and they always paid me well. So I, you know, would do the consulting and cash a check and go on my way, buy a car with it or whatever. Um, so, so Elon, uh, you know, was very insistent, wanted to come, fly into our local municipal airport and come visit me in my home on Saturday. And I said, no, you know, cause I mean, I got kids. I don't know who this guy is. He could be a nutcase. 
And uh, in that case, with a private aircraft, I, I don't care if he's wealthy. And so I lied and I, I said, look, you know, I'm busy, but I'll, I'll meet you at, at Salt Lake City because I've got to fly out of Salt Lake City tomorrow or Sunday. And he agreed. So what I figured is he couldn't pack a gun behind security. And this was pre-9-11. So you could go behind security without uh, without actually having to uh, have a ticket and so on. So so we rented a conference room and, and he showed up and... Um, that's where we uh, started planning this whole thing. And there was a guy named Bob Zubrin who had started the Mars Society. Uh, and Bob's written a number of books called The Case for Mars and so on on all this stuff. So he was he was, he was 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 the person whom I knew that had led Elon to me. So Mar- Bob showed up as well. And uh, we started this mission, right? And so... Now he showed up, Bob showed up at your invitation or part of Elon's? Part of Elon's invitation, yeah. Okay. And you rented a um, conference room at the airport? Yeah, it was in, it was in the Delta uh, Crown Room. And so they had a little conference room there. And so a couple hundred bucks, I rented the conference room. And that's where we had our first meeting, right? And uh, afterwards, uh, took him out and took him to my favorite restaurant in Salt Lake City and and uh, watched Bob slop the soup all over the table. And and uh, then we made our plans and, and went... went uh, went about uh, executing our plans to do this mission. So one of the first things I did was gathered a team of people around me uh, because I had worked with JPL and knew a lot of the guys that did the Mars missions, the Mars Pathfinder that had been recently successful. So I called them and, and then some others that had, had you know been consulting. I, you know, there's a bunch of us that didn't want to be part of corporate America, and I'm certainly one of them. And so I had a lot of friends that, that were like that. So I called them got them involved. So we put a team together and um, we started looking at this mission and quickly decided the logistics of sending, you know, mice on a, you know, million mile journey to Mars and back had its challenges that we didn't want to face. And and I had some friends in Tucson, which I presently live in now, but uh, at the time I didn't, they, they built the biosphere. And if you don't know what the biosphere is, it's a closed uh, facility where, uh, a team of eight spent two years that without any anything coming across the the, the boundaries, it was meant to simulate a trip to Mars uh, and how a crew could live in a closed uh, ecosystem. So they had designed uh, a, a plant growth chamber for Mars that NASA wasn't willing to take the risk on. And so we sold Elon on this. And so it became a lander with a plant that we call Mars Oasis. So with that design, we, we went over to uh, Russia to, to buy the rockets. We, there was a couple of uh, launch vehicles that I was familiar with that would work. And uh, so made the arrangements. We, we made two trips over there. And on the second trip, which was in November of uh, 2001, you know, we, we tried to actually you know, put a contract together with these guys. And first one we went to, we were dismissed. You know, Elon was you know, 20-something a guy who uh, dressed poorly, and that's important to the Russians. And these guys didn't care if he had all this internet money. They, as the Russians said, they considered it bullshit. And uh, you know, they didn't know I sp- spoke Russian, so I, I would let the translator do the work and, and listen. And uh, there was all sorts of interesting derogatory comments about Elon behind the scenes, call him a, a little little boy and things like that. So, so we walked out of that first one after having the chief designer of the design bureau spit on on our shoes, uh, which was sort of a sign of we really ought to get out of here. So we did, and uh, second second group we went to were a little more westernized because they'd been working with some of these Western aerospace companies, and and uh, they they also likewise refused. In fact, the, one of the guys that was with us there were three it was Elon, me, and a guy named Mike Griffin. Now, Mike, uh, if you look him up, was became the NASA administrator later. At this time, Mike had just he just left the CIA. I knew him from that, uh, and he was just consulting. But uh, you know, so the, he later became the NASA administrator and then Under Secretary of Defense under Trump. You know, so so later very important. And uh, so so these these guys all bid us farewell, and uh, in in one afternoon sowed their own fate because. Uh, we started SpaceX based on this and uh, SpaceX put all these guys out of business and uh, at least out of the launch business. So all of, all of Russia's commercial launch business is gone because of, because of SpaceX. So, you know, we headed back to the airport that afternoon after this unsuccessful second meeting 
and uh, we were on the airplane, and uh, Mike and I are sitting in the in, behind Elon a couple of rows. It wasn't very crowded. It was a Delta Flight 31 back to New York City. And every time the plane takes off, you know, from Moscow, you feel like you're on sovereign territory again. And there's a sense of relief, right? And uh, so Mike and I decided to celebrate with some whiskey. And uh, Elon's up in front of us just tapping away on his computer. And Mike, he, he was raised by an army colonel, so you can't, you can't, uh, you can forgive him for speaking this way. But he, he nudges me with his elbow and he says, uh, what the fuck do you think that idiot Savon is up to up there? And I, I looked at him and I said, I don't know, plan nine to save the earth. And Elon turns around to us. He goes, no, guys, we can build this rocket ourselves. And and uh, Mike looked at me and I looked at him. We rolled our eyes. And Mike says, well, Elon, there's a whole graveyard full of dead bodies. You're going to have to walk over to get to that point. It's not like nobody's ever tried this. And there there had been a lot of failures, right? So this was not a new aspiration. And he says, but I have a spreadsheet, you know. <laughs> I said, oh, Mike, nobody's ever made a spreadsheet of the rocket, so here. And he, you know, so Elon's like, fuck you, here, take a look. So he sends his computer back, and we, we had a look at it. And uh, surely it was it was a pretty good spreadsheet. And uh, so I asked him, I said, where where'd you figure this out? I know he had borrowed my college textbooks on launch vehicles and propulsion, but uh, I, there wasn't really enough in there to do what he'd done. And so he uh, he admitted to me that, that uh, he'd been hanging around with uh, some of the other guys in the design group that I'd put together. And their hobby, instead of racing cars or doing something sensible like that, was building rockets in their garage. And, you know, we're talking 30-foot tall rockets and going out into the, into the desert and launching them and having them come down and smash all over the desert floor. So Elon had go out and seen one of these flights and just, it, it was sort of like he'd saw God, you know, and he imagined that, hey, you know, if these guys can do this with beer money, imagine what I can do with... Uh, with, with real money that I can raise, right? So that that's what Elon brought to the table is his ability to raise capital. Can I back you up just a little bit? You said that you'd had six or seven calls over the prior year or two of guys that claimed that they wanted to do something like this or and it was hard to t- take them serious. You end up in a conference room with Elon in this Delta, you know, uh, airside conference room. Um. How long were you with him, and when did he flip you from you thinking it's just another one of these phone calls to buying in or wanting to actually take an action with him? Yeah, I was with him about two hours on this meeting, and I would say prior to even meeting with him, he he kind of had me because of his insistence on doing this now, and that was unusual. So most of these guys had a had a much more casual pace about them, but you know it was as if it was as if his, his tail end was on fire and he was trying very hard to put it out and he was moving fast as a result. And, uh, you know, he wanted to come to my house. He called me on Friday night and wanted to be there Saturday morning with a private jet. And uh, this this was not normal right. behavior. Like, no. Yeah, <laughs> okay. well, I didn't want him in my house, you know, and uh, it, it would be a little awkward. Um, you know, now I kind of feel dumb, but, you know, at the time I think it was prudent. Um, but uh, yeah, the the rest of them, you know, like the, the 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 Gross brothers, you know, it was part of their business plan, and you know, we we did actually take some trips over there, but you could just tell by their you know their their sort of way they talked about things, they weren't very committal. They were inter- interested in exploring what this might do, and uh, you know, Elon was it was it wasn't anything about exploring. He's like, okay, our next step is this, this, this. It was very concrete steps that he was taking along the way. And, and you could just tell he was very determined to do this. My only question is, did he have enough money? And I, and, you know, even to the day I left, I didn't think he had enough money. In fact, I was right um, because um, they got to the fourth launch of, of their Falcon 1, which was the, the original rocket that I saw the spreadsheet design of. And they were down to $137,000 in their bank account. And, uh, but, but their fourth one had been successful. And uh, the Google founders wrote him personally a, a check for several hundred million dollars, and that, that he invested that back into uh, into SpaceX and Tesla, by the way. And uh, so, so that's how they uh, that's how they survived that. And then, then what happened on top of that was the shuttle uh, got retired, and uh, 
nobody saw that one coming really. Nobody saw the Columbia accident happening. And so NASA had to have a replacement. And so here SpaceX was. So, so you know, you say I'd rather be lucky than good. Well, he's both. He's, he's lucky and he's good. And uh, that's worked out very well for him. But you can just tell, you know, he's the smartest guy I've ever, ever dealt with, you know, um, by far more intelligent than me or you or anybody I know. And uh, un, un, unusually intelligent. It's almost scary how, how quick he picks up on things. And, you know, as I, as I dug into, you know, once I knew his name wasn't Ian, it was Elon, I dug into his, his, his past, you know, on, on Saturday. And uh, I could tell the guy was very, very real. You know, it was, this was, PayPal was his second company he had started. So you can tell he had this serial entrepreneur thing. And he had, he had another thing he called the Musk Foundation. And one of the things he told me that I still haven't forgotten to this day is, you know, he explained his life philosophy is there's three things he wants to accomplish with his life. One is to show humanity could be multiplanetary species. Second is to get humanity off of fossil fuels. And the third is to develop technologies in ways that uh, the, the tyrants and governments of the world couldn't control the freedom of movement of humans. And uh, so, so, you know, I, I, except for the fossil fuel thing, I could get behind the other two. The fossil fuel thing, I didn't feel as strongly as he did. But, you know, what, what you would see is... Um, is you know Elon was really um, really true to that vision over time you know Solar City and then Tesla and so on and you could see that in his uh, in his uh, Musk Foundation website you know and, and he was funding things and so I just he just had the air of real. This has been Jeff Stearns connected through cars. 